Hi everyone and welcome to Open Glam Now, the Swedish National Heritage Sports webinar series on open cultural heritage collections and institutions by digital means. My name is Larissa Borg and I am working at the Department for Digital Dissemination here and I am very glad that you are taking part today. Today we are going to talk about the role of user-generated content in opening up collections and we are going to discuss questions such as how can physical and digital visitors contribute to cultural heritage institutions knowledge? Why is it important to collect different kinds of memories? And where can we work together with existing projects? As always, if you want to discuss these uh, topics further in social media, please use the hashtag OpenGlamNow. So first of all, let's explore a little bit further what user-generated content or UGC actually is. So UGC is considered as media created not by the editors of a web service themselves but as users. That means that for example Europeana as a web service creates content themselves, for example blog posts or galleries or museums um, upload own content um, from their collections. But there are also possibilities for users who are not institutions or employees of um, uh, Europeana who can create their own content. So if we talk about requirements for um, something being considered user-generated content, there is first of all the publication requirement. So the um, content um, that is being created um, should be published in some context, for example, on a publicly accessible website or on a page on a social networking site that can also be only accessible to a select group of people. There should be um, a certain creative effort um, put into creating the work or adapting existing works to construct a new one. So users must add their own value to the work. And user-generated content often also has a collaborative element to it, as it is the case, for example, with websites, which users can edit collaboratively, um, for example, Wikipedia or Wikidata. And um, user-generated content is generally created outside of professional routines and practices. It often does not have an institutional or commercial market context. In extreme cases, user-generated content might be produced by non-professionals without the expectation of profit or remuneration. So motivating factors can include connecting with peers or achieving a certain level of fame, notoriety or prestige and the desire to express oneself. So who are we going to talk to about this topic today? First of all, I'd like to welcome Adrian and Elisabeth. And Adrian um, works at Europeana and he's collections manager there and responsible for several collections on the Europeana website. He's working in partnership with um, Pan-European Cultural Heritage Institution Consortia. He develops participatory campaigns and season, audience communities and editorial strategies. And he's as well curating and writing editorial features such as blogs, galleries and exhibitions. Right now he is responsible for the editorial part of the Europe at Work project. And Elisabeth is a curator of photography collections at the Stockholm County Museum in Sweden. Since 2011, her work has focused on collecting vernacular digital photography and in developing digital tools and methods for participatory working with the inhabitants of the Stockholm region. Hi, you two. Thank you very much for joining us today. I'm really looking forward to your presentation. And Elisabeth, you're first. So my name is uh, Elisabeth Borg and I'm from the Stockholmslands Museum, the County Museum, where I work with collection strategies. I have a focus on uh, digital collecting. Uh, I have a background as a photographer at different museums, but since 2010, my focus has been on de developing the photography collections at the County Museum. And first, I just want to say a few words about my museum, because we recently became a digital first museum. And that means that we do not have any collections of artifacts or objects, and, and we never did, actually. Uh, and we don't have our own facilities for exhibitions. Uh, but we do have photography collections, and they're both analog and digital born. 
Um, and the assignment that we have from our main funders, the region of Stockholm, is to use digital means for outreach. So, among other things, we make digital exhibitions for our um, web, we write blogs and we make pods, and we produce apps and digital walks. And um, last weekend, we even hosted a, a flash mob, uh, which is on YouTube. But we still have a similar mess mission to other regional museums that is collecting, processing and disseminating cultural history and heritage art and handicrafts of our region. So at my museum, we began with user-generated collecting al already in 2011, when we launched Samtids Build or Contemporary Images, which is our uh, platform for digital collecting. We realized that the time had come to democratic, democratically open up our collections and give people a voice and let them take an active part in building the collections. So on Samtisbil, people can upload any image of their choice. It has to be digital born and the contributor needs to have some kind of connection with our region. So today the collection uh, holds more than 4,000 photographs from a bit more than 400 photographers. Um, and we have used mixed methods of outreach sometimes addressing certain topics or communities, but always keeping Samtis Build open for anyone to contribute at any time. So Samtis Build is one of the foundations of the research project that I will continue to talk about now. So getting back to today's presentation, I will focus on the research project collecting social photo. I will talk about social digital photography and different methods of collaborating and collecting using examples from the case studies that we have made in the project. And I will end by introducing a web app for collecting. So the Collecting Social Photo is a three year long Nordic project researching how museums and archives can change, how we work with photography collections in the age of social media. And the partners of this project, uh, it's the Nordic Museum, the Stockholm County Museum, the Finnish Museum of Photography, and the All Boys City Archive in Denmark. And the research partner is the Department of Social Anthropology at Stockholm University. And then, without funding, there's no project, so we say thank you to Riksbanken's Jubileumsfond. Um, this is our third year, and the project ends in March next year. So social media in combination with smartphones have profoundly changed the photo and also photographic practices. And the social digital photograph challenges museum and archival practices in many different ways. For example, it, it's the trustworthiness of the social photo. Uh, as you know, it can be man manipulated and um, there are issues with the uh, copyright, and then, of course, fake news, as we all know about. Um, and then we have the presence of non-standardized formats and low-res pictures, uh, and also the collection databases' inability to host complex digital objects that usually have several layers of information. But one might ask, why should we even bother to collect this thing we, we call social digital photography? Well, never before in the history of photography have so many people photographed and shared so much of their everyday lives. So the social photos, they have by far outnumbered and replaced analog photography. And yet we fear that these images will not be available for future gen generations, as they are either locked into personal accounts on social media or at, at risk of being deleted or lost in cloud services. And recently we have actually seen examples of, of digital born material either being deleted by social media platforms or they have simply just lost it. And one striking example of, of this is um, MySpace. And they claim that they have lost all data that were uploaded before 2016 due to a failed migration. So all music created and shared that wasn't backed up by the user is lost forever. So some even say that we are entering or living in a digital dark age. 
So despite this ocean of photos around, there will be no shoeboxes of grandpa's old photos for us to collect in the future. And the, and, and the social media companies, they are under no obligations to save our mem memories. So what signifies the social digital photograph? Well, it differs from, from the physical object uh, that are common in our collections. Um, a major difference is, of course, the, the massive increase in participation and the number of photos that are shared. The networked social digital photograph is dependent of its context. It's an assemblage of, of the motif, the ge geodata, text, emojis, likes, shares, and the, the network that it is shared on. So everyday social photography today can first and foremost be regarded as a form of communication where the visual resembles words and language. And it is ephemeral regarding the changing practices, but also at risk of being deleted or locked in. So social digital photography can be regarded as cultural heritage, much in the same way as analog photography. It is used online in telling stories, sharing values, and expressing culture. And because of its, of its abundance and common use, the social digital photograph is an imprint of our contemporary society, though very much in need of its context in order to provide value. And this calls for a change of work practices for us at museums and archives. We have to become more proactive and collect in real time. And most important, we have to do it in collaboration with the photographers, the producers of this content. So social media photography has been subject of publications, extensive research, and even some exhibitions. But actually collecting is very, still very rare. So in order to gain insights into the uh, challenges and solutions regarding collecting, we decided to conduct a series of case studies in the project. So we have made 11 different case studies divided into three overarching teams, themes. Um, it's places, visual and social practices, and viral events. And these themes, they de derive from the different missions and collection policies at our uh, museums and archives. And the insights and the lessons learned from, from the case study have been compiled in a set of recommendations and best practice uh, on how to collect that will be published in an anthology in March next year. So in these case studies, we have basically tried out three different methods of selection. That is user generated, where the photographer makes a choice on what to con contribute with and uh, curated where the staff identifies a gap in the collections and reaches out to a community or to an individual. And then we have mass harvesting, uh, which was something that we were very much inspired by at the beginning of the project. But we, we soon realized that uh, it was more or less impossible for us to do. Legally, as the social media platforms such as Instagram do not allow scraping, uh, anymore. And ethically, as people could actually not imagine that a museum or archive would uh, pull their photos and metadata from their social media accounts and then add them into our own collections um, without them saying yes. Um, but we have, however, uh, collected large amounts of metadata in one of the case studies that I will talk about later on. And we use this as more or less supportive documentation for the photos that we collected. Um, and broadly speaking, we have tried out two different methods of collecting, um, where the first compares to working in a more or less ethnographic mode, where we have used um, participatory observation, but also production online. And we have combined it with interviews and image analysis. Um, and here's where longer collaborations can be established on a more or less one-to-one -one basis with the, with the contributors. And one example of this is the Insta Suomi from the Finnish Museum of Photography. And this 
project had a focus on visuality and on Instagram practices. Um, they wanted to understand more about the personal choices made by people sharing on so social media. And the aim was to collect a concise but varied and visually interesting collection of Finnish Instagram in 2018, and they wanted to have rich contextual information. And they also wanted to engage new audiences. Um, and the main focus was in understanding Instagram culture itself. So this is what they did. First, they invited their audience to a meeting at the, at the museum to discuss Instagram culture. And secondly, they reached out uh, by using uh, the, the museum Instagram account, asking people for to um, suggest genres and individuals that they felt that the, muse that the museum should document. And they received hundreds of suggestions. Um, and they selected a couple of study participants um, and they were invited to the museum and they were interviewed and they used photo elicitation as a method where you use the photos and talk about them. The study participants were then asked to propose a representative selection of their Instagram photos to be added to the museum collection. So they added the original photo to the collection uh, and as documentation supporting the photo, they also saved a couple of screenshots where they could also see the comments and likes. And in this research project, we have collaborated with the photographers and we have their consent for uh, collecting photos. But it is equally important to try to preserve the context of, of, of where the images were shared. Uh, otherwise, it will not be understood in the future when the social media platforms are no longer around. And making screenshots was the best option we, we had at this. So in InstaSuomi, a combination of uh, user-generated and curated selection methods was used. And co-curation with the audience allowed the museum to test and evolve ideas on what to collect and from whom. And by reaching out on Instagram, they engaged, they managed to engage new audiences. And the co-curation resulted in a much wider and varied collection than what could have been obtained through a more traditional acquisition or curatorial process. And the image by, by this photographer, Lotta Sulin, she has actually, they made an exhibition of her Instagram photos at the museum as well. Another example, of long-term collaboration and user-generated collecting is the case study Christmas in Allboy. Uh, and this was conducted by the Allboy's archives. It has been running since 2012, actually, and it began with the archive identifying a lack in their holdings of modern depictions of Christmas celebration. And they were also looking at experimenting with new forms of user involvement in the collecting process and also uh, digital curation methods using a hashtag. And at the time, in 2012, there were no other examples of museums or archives collecting from Instagram. So the Albor City Archive decided to, to launch the hashtag Christmas in Albor on Instagram, and they combined it with a series of physical activities like hosting Insta walks, account takeovers, and competitions. And they also cooperated with local organizations and media in order to gain visibility for the Instagrammers. Um, during the course of the case study, the archives discovered that by using a hashtag as a method for collection and selection, they could actually build, build a digital community. And it also motivated users to participate and to donate photos and it encouraged others to do the same. And after some time, the hashtag actually became viral and had a life on, on its own, without people, with people using it without knowing that it had been originated by the archives. So the benefits of running a long-term project is the possibility to cover how practices and motifs and user behaviors change 
um, due to, to the changing affordances of the social media platform. And each year, the archive approached a number of participants, asking them to contribute with their photos to, to, to the archive. Uh, but just as with Insta Suomi, it was a manual and quite tedious work because there, weren't, there was no dig digital platform in place where the contributors could upload their photos. So they had to do it by email and signing uh, contracts and stuff like that. The second method of collection that we have tried is um, rapid response collecting, where a museum or archive acts on an ongoing event in society. And we have used this method when we have collected from viral events that had a very quick progress. Um, and one insight from the case studies that we have made is that rapid response collecting combined with agile work methods is particularly useful when it comes to collecting from so social media. Um, we were only a few months into our project. Uh, we began in 2017 when a terrorist attack hit Stockholm in April 2017. Uh, and But we still decided to launch two rapid response collecting initiatives. One was made by the Nordic Museum and the other one by the Stockholm County Museum in collaboration with the City Museum. And neither of us had collected from sudden traumatic events before using dedicated online collecting tools, nor had we set up online collecting initiatives with such short notice. And we had not used hashtags for framing collecting initiatives. So the Nordic Museum, they targeted the hashtags Open Stockholm and Pray for Stockholm that people used after the attack to communicate and share photos. And they published a sponsored post, <clears throat> sorry, and asking people if they had shared any images uh, using these two hashtags. And they all asked them to contribute the photos to the collecting website minnen.se uh, and answer a few questions in a survey. At the Stockholm County Museum and the City Museum, we focused on collecting photographs connected to the attack, but also people's stories and experiences from the attack. Um, we asked people to contribute photos to Samtidsbild and written stories and text con conversations, SMS. Um, but they were directed to a tempor temporary Tumblr blog, uh, which was a bit confusing. Uh, so sometimes the photos ended up there and we had the text con conversations on Samtids build. Um, later on, we also collected screenshots from the photos that were shared with us. Um, and outreach, outreach was made through a tra tra traditional press release. Um, on both sides, people were allowed to upload any image of their choice, and we did, we did not make any active selection at all. So in total, um, 600 photos were contributed. And on both collecting web websites, the content is not moderated uh, before it is published. And this is because it is important for the photographer that when they have uploaded a photo, uh, they need to get some kind of receipt that the museum has actually received it. Uh, and this did put an extra strain on us because we constantly had to monitor the contributions to make sure that there were no sensitive content. But we also collected metadata using a third party service called Notified. So we downloaded metadata from 7,000 of the 10,000 images that, that were posted publicly on Instagram uh, under, under the hashtag OpenStockholm. And in this graph, we can see how the published posts on Instagram peaks three days after the attack, and then they decline rapidly. Uh, an insight from this is that sharing images online occurs during a very short time span. And this makes it very urgent to use rapid response collecting in re real time and not wait for years until collecting as we normally do. Uh, we also asked people a year later 
if they had saved the images um, in their phone from that day. And now I don't remember the exact percentage, but from this um, event, a large number of people had actually saved their photos. But when we asked in other case studies where there were more like everyday photography, um, people did, did not save them. So if we want to collect, we have to do it in re real time. And in this case study, we learned that different contexts, <clears throat> such as different web interfaces, the questions we ask, the outreach we make, and the scope of the collecting organization, they provide different affordances. So a majority of the photos that, that were uploaded to, to the Nordic Museum are from, from the spontaneous memorials that formed after the attack. And at Stockholm uh, County Museum, where we did, did not specifically ask for social media photography, there was also an element of citizen journalism with photos from the attack itself. Um, I could just add that there, we did not have any sensitive material that were uploaded. Uh, there were on minnen.se, there were a couple of photos, but they were sent to the archive and they were not made uh, public, um, where you could see the, some of the victims. And on Samtisbil, there was an image of the truck where it hit the wall into the department store and was caught on fire. Uh, but there were no sensitive material there either, but it was really nervous days for us and for everybody, of course. So we learned from this case study that social media photography functions as both instant communication during and after the attack, as well as memory. And that people actually wish to contribute to our collections. Social media became an extension of the traumatic event and people shared images not only to share their experiences but also to try to grasp on a more personal level what had actually happened. And in several of the other recent terrorist attacks around Europe, museums and archives, they have collected objects from the spontaneous memorials. But in this case, we realized the photos that are shared on social media, they play an equally important role in the memorialization of the attack and are therefore equally important for us to collect. So to conclude, I will now return to the reasons why museums should engage in user-generated collecting. And then I will end by saying a few words about the digital, digital collecting tool that we have created. So what are the benefits for the museum or archive to collect user-generated gen photos? Well, by collaborating with photographers, they become stakeholders of the collections and consequently they become or stay re relevant to them. Um, and museums and archives, we can reach new audiences. And collecting user-generated material is part of a democratic process where more voices are engaged in building the col collections. And in the end, this will lead to more representative collections. And collecting in real time allows for rich context and better metadata, which is added value for the collections. So now, because now we have the chance to get the information that we know that we need, um, as opposed to the older photography collections that we have with lots of portraits, for example, with people that we don't know who they are. And now we can get this information from, from the source. But what's in it for the user? Why should they co contribute? Well, we made a survey in the project and the answers from that survey, as well as answers from the interviews, um, people said they were positive to the idea of offering their photos to museums and archives um, because people see the, the benefits of us being stable and long term and thus more sustainable than commercial platforms. Uh, and therefore we are more safe. So by contributing their photos to the museum or archive, they will live on into the future. They are preserved. And in the case studies, 
uh, we also notice that there actually is a wish among par participants to be co-creative and they want to participate and we should use this force, <laughs> I think. So in order to be successful in use of generated collecting, we need to have a human-centered approach. We need to create relevant and engaging dialogue through carefully planned engagement initiatives uh, with communities and individuals. And we need to invite these communities and also individuals to become co-curators and co-producers. Um, and we need to en encourage curators and archivists to act more as facilitators rather than gatekeepers. And we need to maintain a responsive work pra practice, allowing for quick responses in a rapidly changing environment, as well as building these long-term collaborations with ambassadors. Um, and we need to experiment with different kinds of outreach using both uh, tra tra traditional press, but also try to use sponsored posts on so social media. Um, and of course, combine it with physical meetings. And if the aim is to um, collect user-generated content from social media, it is essential that the staff is digitally literate and also active on social media in order to connect with, with people, but also to have the right tonality. Uh, and these are um, things that will be in included in the recommendations that is one of the outcomes of this project. So finally, I would like to present uh, the web app for collecting that we have developed. Um, so when asking people to contribute with own photos to the collections, we need to make sure that the process is smooth and easy uh, and maybe a bit fun as well. Um, as we are in fact competing with social media, we have to make people leave social media platforms and go to our uh, platform. Um, and at the same time, we have to make sure that we get enough metadata to support the, the image contextually. And therefore, it is necessary to have some kind of digital tool. Um, and it's also needed in rapid response collecting, because there, there's very little time to uh, pr prepare, and everything needs to be in place legally and ethically. Uh, in the case of the terrorist attack, when the city museum and and the um, and and my museum, the attack was um, on Friday afternoon, and we made a decision on Sunday to start to collect. And on Monday morning, we um, we began. We had a meeting and we had the tool in place, and we could send out this press re release. So it was very very quick, and we did make some mistakes with a tumble log. But anyway, um, I've already mentioned that at uh, that Nordiska Museet and the Stockholm County Museum, we have digital platforms for collecting and we have used them for several years. So we have used the experiences from these two tools when we have developed this new web app. Um, and this new, new tool, it connects collecting with disseminating as publicly shared in images, they are searchable in the web app. And that also becomes this receipt so that when you have uploaded your photo, you can immediately see it there. Um, and it's easy for staff to set up new collecting initiatives. So the goal for us is to offer an easy to use, open source digital tool for museums and archives to use at the end of our project. The web app, as for now, it's a working prototype. It's ready to be used, but we want to have more functionalities. Um, so hopefully we will be able to apply more funding and also uh, to continue this work. So the web app today exists in five different versions, where we, the participating museums and archives, we have one instance each in our own language. Um, it has been developed by an American firm and in March 2020, next year, uh, the default version will be available for anyone to download from GitHub uh, to be able to test and perhaps continue to de develop. 
but we are, are hoping that there will be a possibility to get a licensed, customized version further on. But now we are soon wrapping up the entire research project and it will end in March. And we have a conference at the Nordiska Museet, 19th to 20th of, of March. So please, please save the date and it will soon be possible to, to sign up for this conference. And then we are also launching an anthology with texts about all the case studies that we have made, also about image recognition that we have experimented with, uh, the web app, and of course the recommendations. But before that, we will continue to run some tests on the web app. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elisabeth, for presenting your research and the Collecting Social Photography project today. Um, I think it was really interesting to gain more insights into what digital social photography actually means, how it transformed what we understand as photography in the museum collection sense, and um, also how you can connect with your communities with um, engaging in user-generated content collections. So thank you very much for your contribution to this series. Um, stay tuned, everyone, for our discussion afterwards, because we are now um, going to listen to Adrian's presentation. Thank you very much for uh, inviting me, Larissa, um, and thank you for organizing this whole series of uh, webinars. They've been great. And also, I think, uh, thank you to Elizabeth, because I saw lots of parallels in what we have been doing and in your project and similar issues, challenges, and uh, indeed benefits as well. So today, what I'm going to present is um, about uh, Europeana and our work around user-generated content. For those that already know Europeana, uh, many of you will probably know of Europeana as a website where you can discover uh, European cultural heritage from museums, galleries, libraries and archives. But Europeana is more than just that one website. Europeana is a whole network and uh, ecosystem uh, in, in to achieve the work of uh, having a website. We uh, do a lot of professional and sectoral support to help the cultural sector in its digital transformation and uh, also bring a lot of material online. The idea, the grand mission of Europeana is to transform the world with culture, but in a practical sense, we do that by building on Europe's rich cultural heritage and making it easier for people to use, whether for work, for learning, or just for fun. So today, what I will talk about is uh, how Europeana engages and creates uh, user experiences with a specific reference to how we have user-generated campaigns and projects uh, in the past and currently ongoing, and hopefully inspire some new ideas and uh, potential collaborations. So a lot of what Europeana does works around the concept of, uh, for, for user uh, engagement, works around the concept of seasons and campaigns. The idea behind this is that we get the right content to the right user at the right time. Uh, so our seasons are thematic campaigns that vary in scope and duration. Some have taken uh, over a year, some have been for one month, some uh, for a couple of months. They're designed to highlight and promote the high quality content that's on Europeana's platforms, uh, both on our platforms, but also highlighting that elsewhere as well, such as in social media or other outlets. Uh, they're designed to engage European citizens um, who are our users of, of Europeana, uh, whether they are doing that for fun, for learning or for their research. And cultural heritage institutions all across Europe. And we do that uh, engagement through different storytelling and participatory activities. So before I talk uh, very uh, heavily about uh, the user-generated uh, activities that we've done, I thought it would be interesting to uh, and useful to introduce the editorial formats that we use at Europeana. Um, they are something that we call thematic collections, which I'll come to at the end, uh, online exhibitions, galleries and blogs. And these are important to sort of know because this uh, helps understand where the user-generated content finds its home. So our exhibitions, we publish uh, several uh, exhibitions a year uh, on a, a diverse range of topics. Exhibitions online are very similar to what you might know as exhibitions offline. Uh, they look at a topic uh, from a, a wide variety of, of perspectives using cultural heritage material from a number of different uh, organizations across Europe. 
These are often written in with a narrative in mind and often written in collaboration with multiple partners as well. Our galleries are short, um, up to 50 images uh, selected from Europeana on a specific topic. They can come from, and they should, we hope, come from lots of different organisations across Europe showing the commonalities in collections and also maybe differences and nuances uh, in, in, um, in the topic. Our blogs are uh, short, um, uh, shorter uh, words, uh, pardon me, narrative-led uh, event outlets which uh, tell a story about a specific uh, topic. So uh, we have written things, for example, uh, profiles of people, uh, profiles of companies, uh, for example, looking at a specific topic from different aspects uh, around Europe. All of these aspects find um, a home in what we call our thematic collections. As many of you may know of Europeana, it is uh, a website with 58 million records, which is a huge number and probably not enough, uh, too much for any one person to look at at any one time. To help find content and to help surface content that's uh, useful, we have created what are called thematic collections. These are on different topics, such as, as you can see here, from archaeology to industrial heritage to uh, natural history and photography to help find that content and uh, surface that content as well as tell the stories through our editorial formats such as exhibitions, galleries and blogs. In some of these uh, thematic collections, uh, in particular Industrial Heritage, uh, the 1914 to 1918 which is about World War One, and Migration, there is an element which you can see where on the facet side of things, you can show the content that has been contributed by users. That is a way to show the user-generated content that has come in through our various campaigns and uh, other activities. So mostly today I'm going to talk about um, how we have been doing these user-generated campaigns and continue to do so. The idea of these user-generated campaigns is about bringing uh, culture to people and bringing people to culture. Uh, we want to make sure that uh, uh, culture is something that's part of everybody's lives and um, and is, of course, part of everyone's lives because people's histories and people's stories and people's objects are cultural heritage. We uh, have run these uh, campaigns to celebrate everyday experiences, to democratise and to tell the story of particular large pan-European topics, but from lots of different perspectives, from uh, many different cultures and countries across Europe. In all our work, it's a very important part for, uh, for us to work in partnership and collaboration with uh, cultural heritage institutions as well as other organisations as well. An important part of this is that not every story is recorded already in um, museums, galleries, libraries and archives collections. So this is a way of, of collecting contemporary or indeed stories of the past which have maybe not been recorded or adding more and newer information about those stories that we already know about. So there's a number of different ways that we uh, work with user-generated content. I'm going to give you a quick uh, overview of a few of those, but mainly focus on what uh, we call collection days. So we do some things uh, which are creative challenges. Our uh, annual competition, If It Up, runs in October every year. It's a collaboration uh, with, of Europeana with uh, DPLA, which is the Digital Public Library of America, Digital NZ, which is in New Zealand, Trove in Australia, and Giphy, which is a, a large platform for uh, animated GIFs online. The idea of this is that we uh, have on Europeana and all of these platforms, cultural heritage, which is openly licensed, and we invite creators and to remix that and turn that into a GIF. So you can see, for example, uh, the example here, uh, which uh, in its original state was not animated, and someone has, has done that. We receive uh, nearly 200 entries every year and it's a really creative and um, really exciting way to see culture being remixed in that way. Uh, we also have a site called Transcribathon where handwritten um, stories, letters uh, and, and other uh, handwritten items uh, can be transcribed and uh, annotated. Uh, this is aimed at individuals who do that uh, or teachers in, or different groups. Uh, we often do this in uh, sort of events and challenges on Transcribathon. It's a, a concept called a run where um, 
uh, a specific topic is chosen and then people compete in, in friendly, hopefully, competition to, uh, to uh, transcribe the most. There are a number of other uh, projects uh, running uh, around Europeana in our, in our var very large ecosystem to help um, an annotate and classify culture and the cultural heritage that exists already. So this is an example called Crowd Heritage, which is currently in a beta form, where uh, a number of different campaigns are happening, inviting users to add tags and classify the material they're seeing. So one example is uh, a large number of catwalk photography um, and classifying what color is used in those in the clothing that's in on the catwalk. But mostly, I think what I will focus on today is uh, collection days and the collection days that we have um, been running for uh, nearly 10 years now. At a collection day, we invite people to come to a uh, museum, gallery, library or archive or other cultural heritage institution to share their stories and objects on a specific topic. Uh, this is very much a collaboration with those uh, museums, galleries, libraries and archives. Um, and it's a very, uh, for them, hopefully a very good way to engage their community and maybe introduce digital uh, ways of thinking to their collections and to their audiences. So the topics uh, on which we have uh, done this so far are on World War I, which is uh, simultaneously called 1914 to 1918, on 1989 and around the fall of the Iron Curtain, on migration, and on working lives and industrial heritage. And I'll talk about each one of these in turn. When I describe these, I will be giving a very brief overview. There is probably a lot more I could say on these. So this is a, a kind of a quick introduction to each of these topics. Uh, here you can see also uh, some examples of uh, images from collection days of people coming, sharing their stories. Uh, in some cases, collection days are also accompanied by walking tours, for example, or by uh, performances, musical or, or dance performances, sometimes by lectures or, or panel discussions. And they're a very nice way to engage audiences and then also encourage them to share their stories. So our original uh, user-generated um, campaign was uh, Europeana 1914 to 1918. We've been running this since uh, 2011, uh, and this is around the First World War. The idea of this was to bring together uh, cultural heritage institutional content uh, on the topic of the First World War, but also feature user-generated content together in, in, the same, um, in the same collection. So now uh, it has become a resource uh, with material from 24 different countries in 15 different languages. Um, and it's a unique combination of personal stories as well as public documents and, uh, and objects and audiovisual material. Since 2011, we have uh, run more than 200 collection days on this World War I topic uh, in 24 different countries. Uh, collecting and digitizing more than 200,000 uh, digital items. Um, people have been sharing their stories at, at uh, all of these events, uh, and not necessarily their own personal stories, of course, uh, but uh, in some cases that, but mostly stories relating to their families or their ancestors. So people have, um, have shared many uh, objects, whether medals or... Um, uh, or photographs, letters and other artefacts that relate and tell the story of the First World War from lots of different perspectives. Some of these uh, items uh, have found homes in, for example, uh, exhibitions, galleries and blogs. Um, in um, this exhibition that uh, is highlighted here is called Visions of War. It was uh, using openly licensed content and telling the story of how artists and soldiers depicted World War I using material that was collected during the collection days uh, in, the, in the campaign. So moving on from World War I, I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, Europeana 1989. This was to commemorate the fall of the Iron Curtain in 2013 and 2014, around the uh, 25th anniversary of, of that. We held events across Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, with 11 different partner organizations and invited people to share their stories and objects of that time and their experiences of, uh, of what happened in their families and in their personal lives at, at that time. So they shared many everyday uh, objects, uh, such as, for example, this uh, map on the right, which uh, 
a, a, a young child uh, drew at one point to show how he uh, wanted Europe to be, uh, to ev everyday items like the clothing that they were wearing at the time, drawings, uh, money, and other many, many different, uh, a variety of different objects uh, that, that tell of people's experiences of that time. I'll quickly talk also about uh, an, uh, many of these activities, uh, which I'm now summarizing in a very quick way, uh, have multiple elements to it. So there was an element of, of the 1989 project, which was called Freedom Express, where we brought a number of students around uh, to different places in Central and Eastern Europe on a sort of roadshow, a road, roadshow road trip, um, inviting them to reflect and think about uh, the, the experiences that had happened uh, 25 years before. As many of you will know, this year is a 30 year anniversary of Fall of the Iron Curtain. And this year we've uh, built on the, uh, the previous project by inviting people to take part in what's known as a blog parade. Um, a blog parade is where we invite people to write about or photograph, share their ideas on their own blogs and profiles. Um, on the topic of uh, remembering 1989. Um, so you can look, uh, you, if you search Remember 1989 in Europeana on, uh, online, you'll find um, a link to a blog which will explain uh, that and show the examples that people have already um, uh, contributed. To move on to the next uh, uh, topic, Europeana migration it has been running since uh, 2018. Uh, in Europeana Migration, we created a thematic collection on Europeana, bringing together content uh, on the topic of migration to, from, and within Europe. That includes uh, material from cultural heritage organizations, as well as user-generated content. So Europeana Migration uh, invited people to share their or their family's stories relating to migration to, from, and within Europe. It was, uh, compared to, for example, um, 1418, it was much more contemporary topic uh, because people shared their own individual stories as well as uh, stories from the past. Uh, since last year, there have been 21 events in uh, 12 different countries and more than 600 stories uh, have been shared uh, and we've digitized more than 1,200 different us. So this uh, map shows uh, some of the uh, events where they took place. So from uh, the west of Ireland, uh, Limerick, to uh, Riga in Latvia, to uh, from Wales to Ath Athens uh, in Greece. It was a very mixed uh, number of places, and um, each event was uh, people at each event. People shared their stories, and many there are many similarities, but of course many differences in the stories as well. In addition to, uh, to inviting people to share their stories, uh, we also wrote and uh, told the story of migration in, in many different ways. So we wrote more than 60 blogs and galleries, not just Europeana uh, as an organization, but also working with a number of different um, uh, partners uh, to highlight the shared stories and add historical and cultural context. An example of that is this online exhibition called People on the Move, which has uh, highlights how migration has uh, contributed to culture and changed the world. These are some examples of the objects that were shared uh, from everyday objects such as jewelry and clothing to, um, to letters and postcards written uh, back home again to keepsakes and memories of home that people bring with them when they move to a new place or new country. Um, these, uh, we also made sure that we tried to photograph some of the people who were sharing their stories because in many ways seeing their faces makes, uh, makes the story so much more real. So these are uh, some examples of people who shared their stories uh, in, in, in one of the events across Europe. It's also worth saying that we also created um, a way that people could share their stories online, not just at uh, events. Um, and actually, the, it's the same functionality, and I'll explain a bit more about that a bit later. Last year, during this campaign, we uh, made sure that we understood the impact of that by surveying people who were taking part, people who were sharing their stories themselves, as well as the organizations who were organizing or um, holding events. So what we found was by sharing their stories, by talking about uh, their identities and their histories, that people had um, a more positive view of their identity. They found it e easier to express themselves and said that their levels of self-esteem were higher and had uh, higher levels of self-confidence as well. 
And these are some examples of um, some of the reasons that people uh, spoke about why they wanted to share their story, what they got from sharing their story. So this first person, um, and uh, to be uh, clear for privacy purposes, the people in the photograph are the people who uh, have said these words, uh, that they are very happy and proud that their migration story was published. They, this person was moved reading reading it, and a good, it was a good step forward for them to be able to uh, work on their acceptance of who they are as a migrant. Another person said that when they shared their story, they thought about what had happened in the past. When they were told the story, and in this case it was a story about uh, this person's family uh, from the 70s, that when they were first told that story, uh, this person was young, and now having thought about it with a more mature mind, it made them realise the gravity and importance in their family's culture and their own uh, culture. And there was a very important element of why people decided to share these stories, similar to uh, in, in Elizabeth's uh, project, where people think of heritage as an important thing to, to share, an important thing to record. Um, so one person said that they thought it was important to share a story, as these kind of events that they described are like a witness to history. Uh, the things that are happening in the world now, uh, it's good to record these. And there was certainly an element that they saw cultural heritage institutions as playing a very important role in recording these contemporary stories as well as the stories of the past. Moving on from migration, our current uh, season, which is uh, ongoing but uh, close to its conclusion, is uh, called Europe at Work and it is about working life and industrial heritage. So it is a, um, both an editorial and a participatory season where we are inviting people to share their stories of their working life, both in the past and, uh, and in the present, as well as telling those stories through a variety of editorials on Europeana, uh, as well as features in, um, for example, uh, outlets such as Daily Art. So for this we have held 11 collection days uh, across Europe, uh, from Ireland to Finland, from Sweden to Portugal. There has been one in fact in Sweden, uh, which Larissa was uh, very generously involved with. Uh, it was with the Swedish National Heritage Board and the Museum and Archive of Shivik. Uh, it happened literally just uh, this weekend gone past. At these events people have been sharing uh, stories about different industries, in some cases very varied, in some cases very specific. So we held an event in Finland in uh, a small village called Fiskars, which had a, uh, a very famous ironworks. And the stories were uh, all about that ironworks and working at that ironworks. But in other cases, it's a, a much more varied, um, uh, a much more varied collection of stories. So these events uh, took place uh, in, in these places. Uh, um, what we really liked this year was actually that the uh, events weren't all in, in large cities, but actually in cities, in towns and small villages. And actually it was a really nice way to bring culture to, um, and to bring Europeana to parts of Europe that we had never been to before. So the stories look at uh, people's histories uh, and people's working lives. Uh, some in very um, unique jobs, such as a, an opera singer, some in very everyday jobs, such as shopkeepers uh, or cafe owners, um, sometimes looking at them actually working. Uh, some are historical, some are contemporary, some are about the buildings uh, and some are about the people. It's a, again a very uh, varied uh, set of stories. So far there's been about 150 uh, stories shared. And for editorial for this, we have um, uh, showcased in, in blogs and galleries, uh, 50 blogs and galleries so far, the, the topic of industrial heritage and working life. We've showcased over a thousand different um, uh, cultural heritage items. And uh, these have been written by Europeana uh, and partners from across Europe from a, a number of different uh, projects and cultural heritage institutions. So I'd like to also now talk a little bit about how to take part in these projects and what the benefits of doing so are. So one of the things that we uh, have done is made sure that when we work with these uh, campaigns and projects that we are doing these in partnership with uh, many different organisations from across Europe. To do so we have helped to uh, build promotional uh, tools uh, such as uh, postcards and we can help with the uh, 
with doing so. We've also created a, a guide for hosts, which is a step-by-step -step guide to running a collection day. Uh, I think something really important to show is some events can be very large, some events can be quite uh, more intimate and smaller, but actually all collection days, I hope, are for the organizations and for those taking part, something beneficial to be uh, involved in. An important element is that we have created an online um, form which will allow the story to come on to Europeana. If any of you have uh, ever worked on Europeana projects before and, and aggregated content to Europeana, it's not uh, uh, it's quite a, a complex thing. It, it involves metadata and infrastructure and networks. What this uh, form does is directly um, map the story uh, to the Europeana data model and then allow that to be published very easily on, uh, on Europeana without needing to go through the usual aggregation routes. As you can see on the form, uh, we invite, we ask people to share their name and their email address, which aren't published online. Uh, they can choose to be anonymous if they wish or choose what name they would like the story to be published under if, if they wish to not have their own name. And then we invite people to tell the story and, um, and share objects. The public element is an important part, but actually the working in collaboration with uh, cultural heritage organizations and helping them with their digital transformation is an important element for uh, Europeana. So for the migration campaign, these, uh, these graphs relate to last year's migration campaign. Most of the partners in that established as part of that uh, project established new relationships with uh, other organizations in their, um, in their uh, city or town. Many of them will, well, actually all of them will uh, continue these new partnerships. So they were a way of opening the organizations to other uh, organizations and uh, new partnerships. And those that worked with existing partners uh, agreed that they, the collaboration as part of the migration campaign was a positive uh, collaboration. What we also find is that um, many organizations are uh, trying, many cultural organizations are on a journey of digitization, becoming more digital, uh, whether that's sharing their collections online or in other ways. But it's a, it can be a long journey in a way. And actually these collection days can act as a, a step along that journey. So for example, this quote from the Fiskars Museum is, is talking about that they don't yet have their collections online and they are working on that digitization. And the collection day that they held uh, a, a few months ago will be the first time that they will be able to share some stories from that museum and from, that, uh, from the ironworks online. A similar situation uh, in this quote from the Stiftung Historische Museen in Hamburg, who also held a Europe at Work collection day. Uh, they are also digitizing and uh, in the process of doing that. And the collection days are a step in the visibility and accessibility of, of some of that collection. And it was a motivation as well for their colleagues to, to see how important uh, sharing online and open access can be. But also in, in, in addition to the digitization and transformation, we can see that this is also helping to build audiences and connections uh, for organizations. So this quote from EPIC, the Irish Immigration Museum in Dublin, who have actually held uh, Europe at Work and Europeana Migration Collection Days, uh, shows that they, the collection days for them were a way of transforming how they engaged with the public and provided them with an in impetus and a platform to engage with uh, new Irish communities and allows them, has allowed them to build connections and not just collections. Uh, similarly, but also maybe a little bit more emotionally, the Instituto Cervantes in the Netherlands, who held a collection day last year as part of European immigration, uh, they spoke about how not just simply that it connected them to new communities, but also that the stories are in themselves are, are very, very interesting and, and help memorialize and capture uh, a community. So they held, their event was about the Spanish-speaking community in the Netherlands, and each of the stories had a whole life attached to it, a story of a family and a particular world of memory and remembrance of their migration experience. So it, the event in itself was a very moving and wonderful experience. So I think uh, that is my, the end of my presentation. I would hope that uh, from here you have uh, seen some inspiring ideas and maybe ways that you could work with us on collection days. 
Uh, next year, our topic that we're going to do over the summer of 2020 is about sport, playing into the idea of the summer of sports, such as the Olympics being in next summer, as well as the men's football uh, UEFA European Championships. We're also open, of course, to collaboration on any of the existing topics, and I look forward to hearing any of your questions. Thank you very much, Adrian, for your presentation. Um, I think it was really interesting to see it from Europeana's side of view, how Europeana can also engage better um, with people on the ground, so to say, um, and engage with digital communities too. Speaking of communities, I have a question to you both, actually. Um, so when we talk about the role of communities, um, you both shared with us examples of community building, for example, by creating and using a certain hashtag or how museums can engage with their audiences on the basis of user-generated content. So do you think that collecting user-generated content helps, for example, museums in building up their communities? Well, I think from, from our experience, we have tried, um, I mean, we have both experimented with creating hashtags. Uh, like the Christmas in Olborg, and then there's another one called We We Love Olborg, uh, and then building a community around that, and then you work with other organizations as well, uh, and you need to still have these. Even though you are digital, you still have to have physical meetings with people. You have to, um, the, at, at least in in our experience, because people want to have this um, acknowledgement somehow. Um, and we think that if people, I mean, when they are sharing images on, on, on Instagram, for example, maybe that's enough for them. Why should they bother coming with their photos to the, to, to the museum and the archive if we don't do any, anything extra with them? Um, so I had some insp inspiration here from uh, Erupiana. Um, I think it's, important to continue to to work with this material and not only collect it and the other method that we have tried is to use existing hashtags um, and then it can be difficult to because then the museum is not known in this ha hashtag i think the problems for us has been to sort of get people to move from using the hashtag and then move into another platform to move into our sort of um, environment. I think uh, f for certainly the, the collection days we've had and, and, and that model has uh, definitely helped organizations with uh, community engagement. In some cases, uh, particularly I think in migration, in the migration campaign, by reaching out to communities that they maybe had not uh, reached out to before and had not engaged with uh, that much. And it became uh, a way of um, of having a, a kind of a concrete reason to invite uh, uh, different communities to their, uh, to their uh, museum or gallery library, whichever it was, and often on their terms, because it's, it's not asking them to do a, a very large task or something like that. It's, uh, it's inviting them to share their stories and to, to listen and to hear those stories. And so I think that the, the idea of collection dates for, for sure can really help with, um, with with that uh with community engagement and what we what we particularly at europeana like is when an organization may come to us and say oh we've had this idea of how we would like to work with xyz community or we would like to work with a certain audience and and capture their stories through this uh format i think that that's a really nice way of of sort of marrying the digital and community engagement and Europeana and local at local and European levels. I think that that's a, a really nice synergy. So um, let's talk about the aspect of digital literacy. So Elisabeth, you mentioned digital literacy in your requirements for staff that want to work with the user generated content and engage with digital communities also in the digital realm. Um, so how do you see the aspect of digital literacy when we consider the users? Well, yeah, that's interesting, actually, because in one of the case studies that I've been doing in the project, it was this Facebook group called Family Living, the true story, where people share photos of uh, what their homes really look look like. Uh, you know, it's messy. 
uh, it takes hours just to keep everything tidy and why bother instead you should you know spend time with your family or tv shows or something <laughs> and it's really nice because people they are extremely supportive of each other um, so they share stories about their their lives as well uh, and i when i started with that i contacted people through messenger and i also added content in this group myself um, because i wanted to have some kind of conversation going but anyway um I found out that some of the people who were sharing photos on this uh, in this Facebook group, I would think that they would be that it would be easy for them to change platform and to upload images to Thumbtits Build because we have made it really easy. It is easy, uh, I think, but still it, it, it is an obstacle. Um, so I think that maybe we have to sort of teach people on how to do it and have really good informative um, like videos on how to upload and how to share um, because maybe people aren't as digital literate as you would imagine even though they are using so social media so um, I'd like to get back to the moment actually when people decide to share an image for example on some teats build or um, share a story on a Europeana collection day or in the web form. Do you think that these kinds of activities also trigger some kind of reflection on their own history or their experiences? I think y yes a little bit um, and it maybe comes back a little bit to what you were asking about digital and analogs so uh, at a collection day for example I, I, it is even though it's a digital event and the, the outputs are digital really the experience is, is very analog you you sit at a, a table and you have a conversation with someone and you talk to them they write words and on a computer but it's actually a very analog experience in a way um, and I think there's something quite interesting in that uh, similar to the social media projects is that Actually, for some people, everyday activities are digital and maybe they don't even think of them as digital experiences. They're just on Facebook or Instagram or whatever it might be. I think certainly from the events that uh, we had uh, and a little bit online as well, um, what the reflections that, that uh, I was showing in, in the presentation were, were answers to a specific survey. But also anecdotally, sometimes when we talk to people, even if we don't ask them to fill in a survey, there's very much this element of um, of being proud and of wanting their history in some way to be uh, recorded or shared or maybe even have have meaning in some way. But by writing it down and by sharing it, it gives it gives your everyday experiences some more meaningfulness. Um, For sure, I think a lot of uh, people who took part in, in, in all of the campaigns uh, that we've done see the value of cultural heritage organizations um, as a trusted source of, um, of history. I think that that's very, very true for very many people. It's not true for everybody in every way, but um, certainly in the experiences that we've had in, in the collection days, that people see cultural heritage organizations as a, as a very trusted source of history and and want to share their stories with with those organizations i totally agree with uh, adrian that people i mean sometimes when they are approached and when we ask them if they would like to contribute they get a bit they don't really know i mean they get a bit um, surprised because they haven't really thought about social media content being part of a museum collection or archive um But then they also become very proud and they also it's they um, appreciate that they are sort of seen by us, <laughs> that their everyday life experiences, they it turned into history and they think this is this becomes some, something big. Uh, but I would say um, as a response to your question as well, if that people are quite um, they are aware when they are leaving Instagram, I mean, if they have uploaded a photograph shared an image on 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 Instagram and then when they share it with us sometimes they change the uh, the captions the texts um, because they are aware of being that they are in in a different system that they are at the museum uh, and that's really interesting I think 
it, which also makes it difficult for us because we want to mimic <laughs> what they share on social media. Um, but it's also interesting that people, they're so aware of, of cultural heritage being something important. That makes me really happy. <laughs> The challenges actually that, that we've had, and I'm sure probably similarly in, in other projects, is, is in convincing people that actually their stories are cultural heritage in some way, that their stories are important and worth noting. I think maybe this wasn't the case quite so much for the First World War project because it's uh, 100 years into the past and that's, that's seen as a history that uh, should be recorded. But for, for example, for migration or, or currently even working life, um, some people just think, yeah, it's just my everyday life. It's not really that important. But with a little bit of uh, discussion, then they start to realize, oh, my experiences are maybe unique, or um, my experiences are, even if they're not unique, they're they're still worth recording in some way. And that I think has been a, a challenge for for all our partners and for all for ourselves as well to kind of convince people in a in a positive and, and encouraging and friendly way that their stories are worthwhile and worth hearing and worth recording. Last question today comes from the audience, and the participant asks um, about fake news. Um, have you two experienced um, possible misuses of these collection? Um, activities or of opportunities to work with user-generated content um, and could you explain how you cope with it? Oh I can't actually because it's something that we haven't experienced and we have certainly thought about it. I think that people spreading fake news would be something really interesting for a museum or archive to document because it's certainly part of uh, what social media is used for today uh, but um, I think that we really have to monitor what enters the collections because they are in a sense open. So we have to make, we cannot just sit and just and just watch things enter the, um, the website, but we have to monitor it, of course. Uh, but we haven't had any problems with this yet. And it might be that, well, they haven't discovered us yet. But I think that maybe we should do a project on fake news. <laughs> I think it would be important. Another issue that can be pro problematic is that, at least in Sweden, uh, during the course of this project, uh, less people are actually using social media. So, I mean, my message is that we as museums and archives, we have to be where people are. And at this point, they are on social media, but in five years, maybe they will be somewhere else. And then we have to follow them <laughs> there. I think similar to Elizabeth, we've, we've not really seen uh, something that uh, immediately stands out as being completely false or anything like that. We've had one or two stories that, that have come in online that um, don't always quite make sense, let's say it like that. They, they, it's hard to, to work out what the, uh, the narrative is. Um, but in most cases, particularly at events, when someone sits in front of you and tells their story, we, we, we tend to take them at face value. Of course, it could be the case that uh, people are telling a lie, but um, I, I think it would be hard to, it would be a hard lie to tell in a way, because they would have to literally invent a whole life story in some way that is uh, a lie. Of course, fake news also can sometimes mean just taking a kernel of truth and giving it a total different perspective and that can that could potentially take place but the way we present this is it's people's opinions rather than um, objective fact it's people's experiences and not the um the definitive history of uh, of a specific area it's it's a one individual's story so i think there is a of course a potential and uh, um, and then trustworthiness is an important element of everything that we do and uh, an important uh, part of Europeana's um, um, values is that we are a trustworthy source of information. Uh, but in these cases, I think it, we are maybe lucky, as uh, Peter has asked, that we haven't been uh, noticed in this way. But I also think that if it's an individual story and it's their perspective, then their perspective is actually an interesting thing to to look at and why they are spreading that information potentially falsely, I think is uh, 
an interesting perspective of their perspective, if that makes sense. So thank you very much, Elisabeth and Adrian, uh, for joining this session. And of course, thank you very much to all the participants and the audience that listens to this uh, recorded session. Um, I'm very glad that you um, joined today and I hope you took some inspiration away um, that you can um, use in your own contexts. Thank you very much and goodbye.